Welcome to The Realign. This is the fifth episode, I believe, and today I have the absolute fabulous, fantastic Ali Valkyrie. Uh, I've known Ali for quite some time. I'm going to start by telling a, a cool story, which is the story of how she and I met. Uh, this would be, oh, we're old. It's got to be like seven or eight years ago now. Um, no, actually, it would be nine. It'd be oh, nine no. years ago. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. It was pretty much, pretty much actually like to the month, because it was right. It was like you, we met the week I decided to leave. UG. Yeah. And that was in March of 2014. I remember it very, so very clearly. So we are old. <laughs> uh, that would have been nine, nine years ago, like this week, probably. Because it was just around springtime, too. It was like that moment when everyone realizes it's spring. And when that happens in, in, in rainy, rainy climates, it's that kind of thing where everyone, like, wanders out the door one day and looks up at the sky and sees the big orb and, like, all is restored. Yeah. It was a day like that. Okay. I remember it. But anyway, tell the story. I will tell I'm, the story. I'm, yeah, I'm so... Um, so I had just moved to Eugene after traveling through Europe, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do there. I, was, I had no reason really to be there. Just it just felt like a good idea. But I had heard that like because for a long time I was like I am the only pagan anti-capitalist writer in the world, and everyone was like, "Wait, have you heard of Ali?" I'm like, "What? Who? Who? Who is she?" And uh, we started talking online a little bit, and then when I was in Eugene, I was like, "Okay, so we have to meet." And she, she tells me, yes, okay, so let's meet um, this, at this, this tea house, I think it was. Uh, so I'm on my way to see her, and I, I see her at the end of the street on the sidewalk. And uh, she's walking towards me, and then she kind of just turns and looks at something. And I'm about to like, hey, hey, I'm, I'm Reed. And, and she's like, hey, it's great to see you. Hold on a second. And suddenly she gets out a tape measure. And... <laughs> And then she starts. So, so what was happening in Eugene, if I remember correctly, was it, there was a rule where, um, or basically, the police were trying to get rid of vagrancy, and they were telling people you couldn't be doing things at, at, at certain places on the land, on the city property. But Ali had looked up the specific law, and she was extremely good at knowing all of the the land use laws. And, and this has always been kind of one of your fortes forever I think and uh, so whenever she saw police trying to harass someone she would get out her tape measure and try to show them that they were not uh, actually violating the law and that's what was happening then be, correct to, to be more yeah to be more specific you know there's always a line between public and private right. property and I had a copy of the tax maps of every single block in the downtown area of course you did and the cop, <laughs> you know there was this there was this blanket they, I mean, it was really insidious, um, but apparently legal that the, the cops would have all this business, the business owners sign a, pay, a piece of paper that gave the cops permission to arrest anyone who was on private property for trespassing, mm -hmm. even if they were just like leaning against the wall, having a cigarette. If you were touching private property, um, they could arrest you for trespassing. But depending on the block, there was anywhere between eight and 12 inches that 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 was the delineation between private property and city property and the cops either because they didn't know it or they assumed that the person they were harassing didn't know it would very often uh give a trespass ticket to people when they were actually on public property so when i would see one of those things going on i would run over with my you know and it wasn't just a measuring tape just so people no, know it, it was, was like a big, measuring yeah. i mean you know, like the whole like open carry macho man thing where they walk around with like the big gun. This was like, this was my version of that. I would stroll up with this big ass fucking orange, like the kind of tape that's used. To, I mean, what it's used for is for land surveying. It was literally like a land surveying tape. And I would have literally had the maps in my fucking purse. <laughs> and I would make the measurement and I would show the cop the map. And, and yeah, Reed like walks up and the second I see him, I see him in one corner of my eye. I see what's about to be a ticket written in the other corner of my eye. And I'm like, uh, I'm sorry, I need to do a thing. And if I remember, if I remember correctly, I didn't even have to finish the measure. Like the cop knew I was right because I was always right. And he just kind of, you know, gave me a fuck you look and walked away. And then Reed and I just went and like had a cup of tea. So this is my uh, first. Like we had known each other forever. Yeah, this is my first meeting with Ali. <laughs> And uh, so, so the reason why you're on here, uh, besides the fact that you're amazing, is we're going to specifically talk yeah. about land. Um, 
Thank you. And, yes. and Ali teaches a course through Ratona, Gods and Radicals Press. She was uh, the co-founder of Gods and Radicals with me. And she teaches a course, and this course is brilliant. This isn't just an advertisement for the course, though. What I, what I want to do is, is, is for all of you, all of my listeners, to, to actually hear uh, just even a tiny bit of your massive breadth of, of, of information about land. Like, you know more about land than I, I could ever imagine. And... Um, and your course is pretty packed with information, but even still, there's so much that you couldn't fit into it. Um, so, no, the degree to which I had to edit that was, was kind of torturous, frankly. Uh, no like, doubt. it was, I, I it could have been five times as long, but I know, you know, I would have lost 90% of, of would be students. Yeah. Right. I had to, like, make it TED Talk when I really just wanted to be, like, university professor putting everyone to sleep, right, you know? Right, right. So, let's back, feel, let's back up just for a about. moment. And, and yes. okay. you tell us who you are in your own words. I don't know who I'm a semi-retired hellraiser who hides from the public. Um, I don't know who I am. Um, <laughs> actually, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, when you asked me to write a biography, I did a really creepy thing, um, and I didn't use it. But I, I, because everyone's talking about chat GPT, oh, no. chat GPT, that. <laughs> I went to chat GPT and I said, "Tell me about Ali Valkyrie." And wow, holy shit! It was like ninety-five percent accurate. Um, the one thing that it got wrong, which was really hilarious, um, and I didn't really, I didn't even connect or connect it. I didn't correct it because I was just so tickled by it. Um, it mentioned that I was in some band. Um, I forgot, I forget the name of the band. Um, but I looked them up and it was like this kind of like, I would call it like martini swing music. Uh, <laughs> So chat, chat, chat GPT almost got to. So yeah, but it's like it really and, and the little details that it knew, like you know, like me like whipping out a tape measure in Eugene, Oregon, like it was kind of creepy. But anyway, okay, let me try. I'm digressing. Okay. I'm really good. What I am is a professional digressor. Absolutely. Um, I'm a writer. I guess I'm a kind of a former activist that kind of takes a back seat now. Um, for a decade or so, I worked. Uh, one-on-one with homeless populations in the U.S., uh, chiefly in Eugene, Oregon, and kind of served as what I kind of call like a liaison between street families and cops for several years. And over the course of that time, uh, got a few government officials fired and cops fired and then kind of had to leave town because I um, pissed off the good old boys (laughs) network that runs places like Eugene, Oregon. (laughs) Um, I'm kind of a lifelong animist, a lifelong leftist, um, a lifelong artist. Uh, I currently make my living making ceramics. Really I brilliant ceramics. Made... And before that, really brilliant Thank you. Yeah, textiles, like everything yeah, she's done. I've made, I spent a decade running a tiny little clothing label, both in New York, Eugene and Portland, Oregon. Um, I don't really do that anymore, but actually I'm reformatting all my old designs and I'm putting them on one of those print on demand things because I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting on potential passive income and I might as well fucking do something with it. Um, nowadays, uh, six years ago, I left, I left actually the same time Reed left the United States. Yeah. Um, since then I've been living in, uh, Hen, which is the capital of Brittany, which is Northwestern France. It's a little peninsula that kind of fucks up the hexagon um (laughs) and and actually me moving from the united states to here was one of many things that deeply influenced and shifted um which kind of like a lifelong pursuit of for me of thinking about land um i think that's something that's kind of been a theme my entire life and it's funny that you you started with the story that you you started with because you know, I, I would definitely wouldn't have seen it at the time. You know, I can kind of draw a direct line between wielding a, a, a industrial <laughs> tape measure through the streets as though I'm I'm a you know soldier with a gun, um, and then developing the course that I ended up developing a decade yeah, later. Exactly. Um, so you know, and then it doesn't. But yeah, uh, so that's I I do lots of shit. Right, and and the <laughs> the specific thing um, that. W- your course is about so the course is called lands loss and reconnection 
And it, it kind of compiles everything that you've learned about land along with, you know, much of it is public knowledge, but then also some really profound observations that you've had. Um, first of all, could you talk about what, um, what you mean by land loss? Like, what is, what is the meaning of land loss? Well, I think there's two levels to it. There's one just the way we all have lost connection to land under capitalism. Um, no matter where you're living in the world, you are being affected by this to a certain extent, you know, whether you're living in somewhere that's just brutally capitalist, where, you know, to the extent where, you know, leaning on a wall get you arrested, like most cities in the United States, or if you are an indigenous tribe living in the Amazon, where technically you're supposed to have rights to your land, but someone like Bolsonaro sells your, you know, allows freaking, you know, uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not spectators, developers, um, come on. developers, yeah, to, you know, kill you to take your land. Um, there's nowhere in the world that to an extent is not directly affected by this idea of land ownership, which I think especially much, much more so if you grow up in a Western slash developed country, we just kind of assume has always been this way. Um, and in the United States, at least when it comes to settlers of European descent, it had always been that way. And so the kind of the second level I take in this course, um, it, you know, it's, it's not designed specifically for settlers of European descent, but that is the kind of the framework I focus on myself being a settler of European descent that grew up in the United States. Um, and then, at, you know, in my mid thirties, <laughs> moved back to the continent of my ancestors who you know, one of the main reasons they went to the United States in the first place was loss of land. Right. Because so much of what, you know, what um, spurred on European migration to North America in the first place was, was a 500 year cycle of loss of land, which happened in tandem with, with the rise of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of, you know, there, there's an umbrella issue that I explore throughout the course just about the history of the loss of land um, what it meant to different groups of people in Europe and then in the United States, because, you know, the, the, the cycle of taking, it's, it's that hurt people, hurt people cycle yeah. <laughs> taken so, into to real life, right? And, um, and was, that's how was, we touch the land. I was going to ask you, so because the next question is, is what is the significance of, of land loss? Like, you know, I, I remember growing up not really, I mean, you generally don't understand w what is possible with land if you didn't grow up having access to it, having a connection to it. It's only when you start to want, want to do certain things where you realize, oh, wait, I'm not allowed to do this. Like, for example, trespassing um, or, hey, I would love to grow my own food. Oh, I don't actually have access to it. I mean, I, I do now. We have a nice garden. But, you know, this is a very common thing where we, we only start to recognize what we that loss when we start to, you know, want to do a little bit more with ourselves and some, suddenly we find we're faced with these, you know, this, this epic regime of laws and customs that prevent you from even, you know, doing anything with lands, right. ever, even being connected. So what, what besides the, cause you mentioned the hurt people, hurt people, like the cycle of colonization, the cycle of, of land displacement, um, what is a good way to summarize, and we'll talk about it more, but what is a good way of summarizing um, the significance of our loss of connection to land? Well, I think, um, <clears throat> for example, look at the way we define the word indigenous, for example, as opposed mm. to settlers, right? right. Um, and just, you know, for those listening, I'm going to use this in a global context, not necessarily a North American context where often, you know, we, are, we use the word indigenous as a synonym for Native American First Nations. That's not what I'm going for in this. I'm going with the, the bigger definition, for example, the definition that the UN would recognize, um, which to um, summarize, you know, we, we define indigenous as a, a minority culture that has a history of connection to the place that they live and has a specific life way, folk way, culture, usually language connected to the place that they live that is in opposition 
or is in minority in contrast to the nation state that claims the land they're on. Right. So you see, you know, you have a, a, a intact cultural group that that the heart of their culture is the land they're on, um, which is why, you know, for example, you look at the history of native displacement in the United States. And, you know, they weren't just displacing people because they wanted that land. That was part of the reason, of course. But they were also displacing tribes because they understood full well that so much of what made them native was collect connection to that specific piece of land. And the theory was that by removing them for them from that land, that would cut off the cultural connection that would help. It's the whole, you know, save the man, kill the Indian idea right. that would help yeah. to assimilate them into whiteness. And one of those things, you know, in included in that, um, and, and this is, you know, it's been mentioned in many places, but uh, Melinda uh, Reidiger mentions it in her new book, White Deer, uh, the the killing of the buffalo uh, in in America specifically to starve off the indigenous people in order to you know more easily conquer them like that was you know land is not just you know it's not just earth it's also you know all of the things on the land as well and attempting to sever people's connection from that it does is not just a Hey, move from this spot. It's it's a much mm. wider uh, cultural, spiritual disconnection. There's so many aspects to it. Um, yeah, and an extremely effective one. You know, both in, in terms of killing the culture, but also in creating dependency. You know, what it, k killing the buffalo is what directly led to a century's worth of of food programs where Native American communities were very intentionally given the absolute worst kind of, I mean, even from a, a European perspective, like the absolute worst quality food you could possibly imagine. And even though it's, it's, you know, it's been a century or so since the government has, boom, killed Native Americans, they are still killing them through incredibly high rates of obesity and heart disease and diabetes and all these things that have come specifically from the act in the late 1800s of killing off all the buffalo, killing off their ability to feed themselves through the ways of, of, of their traditional culture and making them utterly reliant on food that was specifically designed to kill them. Mm, um, mm. And, and, and this is, this is a this is something that has happened and you bring this up repeatedly, like, you know, this is just another manifestation of the same cycle that occurred previously in Europe. It isn't just yeah. like, it didn't just start with the indigenous people in North America. This was a, uh, you know, you use the, the phrase importation, like, you know, the, I, the, the European framework, the, the European crimes, the crimes against the peasants, against the serfs, etc. Um, were just exported to the rest of the world. Like everybody else, it was like, hey, this works really well here. This is how we control right. people. Let's do this elsewhere. And again, and on, on two levels, like you see that on a nation state level, right? Like, for mm -hmm. example, you know, the, what the, 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 power structure of the settlers in North America, the methods they used against the Native Americans were directly inspired by the way that the, the British colonized the Irish, for example. You, know, you see direct correlations between the way that, you know, the Irish were put in specific residential schools and not allowed to speak their language, the same thing in Wales, the same thing in Scotland, the same thing in Brittany, and the way that exact same thing was done to the Native Americans. And then it goes back, right? When Hitler was interviewed about what was his, his inspiration for for what ended up being the final solution he pointed to two things he pointed to to the boer wars in south africa and the treatment of native americans in the united states so you literally have this 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 uh what's the word i'm looking for God, feedback damn, loop um, right feedback yeah feedback. you have this feedback yeah. loop that went from europe to the united states and then back to europe but then you have it on a different level then you have it at the level of the peasantry right so you have 200 300 years worth of mass migration to the united states from europe most of it being at, at the be, at the beginning, it was the wealthier folks, and I, and you know this is one of the things I, I outline because I think this isn't made clear to us even with the amount of like history that that North Americans are given that focus on them as opposed to the people they oppressed. The aspect of class usually isn't really all that outlined. 
where, you know, the early migration, you know, when you think of the colonists in the revolutionary era, those were much more the upper class. It wasn't until the early to mid 1800s where you had again these, these, these waves going through Europe, whether it was the Highland clearances or the, the results of what happened when, when um, Italy consolidated. You know, all through Europe, you have these waves of peasants being pushed off their land. And the only place to really go was the United States. So they land in the United States under, under uh, promises of free land. Mm -hmm. And when they get there, <laughs> they're basically handed a gun right. and said, and so oh, you can go have, free this land for us. Yeah, you can have that land over there. You, yeah. just have to defend, you just have to defend it and kill anyone who says it's theirs. And so, you know, and that, that's the hurt people, like it's literally the cycle of abuse, where you have these abused people fleeing abuse who come to the, the promised land who are told, well, you know, you can, you can have what you were promised. You can, you can elevate your social status if you do what was done to you. Yeah. So, and that continues to this day. I mean, that continued through redlining. That continu that, that, right. That's gentrification. You know, this, this cycle has never stopped. And, and if, if anything, I feel like it's, it's been more hyped up in the past two decades than at any time since the passing of the Civil Rights Act, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, so with the large, or like the larger principles of like land, like uh, you in your course, you kind of divide up like the specific, um, specific ideas that, that happened or specific transitions that we went through it. And, and uh, this is always important for people. Not everybody understands or it's really hard to understand like that, that this regime of, of land rights, uh, you know, capitalism itself is is new. It was developed over a long period of time, but it, it, it relies on specific principles that were not universal and were not even historical uh, no, when they came about. And still, and one of them... still not universal. You know, I just want to like just right. add a difference between, you know, Europe, which is still very capitalist, and the United States in terms of, you know, but we'll get into that. So yeah. go back to where you were. Sorry. So, um, yeah, so, so discuss a little bit, if you don't mind, um, uh, private property. You know, that's that's probably... I, I think one of the, mm -hmm. the founding ideas that that kind of prevents you everywhere right. um, with land connection. So what's fascinating to me the most about private property is, again, you know, as somebody growing up in the United States, right, um, who always, like I remember as a child learning, you know, like the fence between me and my neighbor. And, you know, and I remember my mother explaining to me, well, this is our property and this is their property. And, you know, you can go over there because they're our friends. But in general, if they're not your friends, you know, you, you can't cross that barrier. Or, you know, like being a, a Girl Scout and being on like hikes in the woods and all of a sudden coming to like a crossroads, coming to a, a fork in the path where there would be a sign that would say like private property. And I'd be like, well, why? Like, nobody's using it. Why would not I, I be able to walk there? And, you know, it always being puzzled by that. But also, again, growing up in the United States, where that's just so deeply normalized. And I mean, the, 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 the rigidity of private property, and frankly, private property as a religion, um, I, I, I definitely believe is stronger in the United States than anywhere else in the world. And I think part of that, well, I don't think, I know, um, <laughs> don't use those weak words. Um, part, <laughs> has everything to do with the nature of the United States as a, a settler, you know, originally a settler colony, and the ability to which the, you know, those in power, you know, whether we just call the founding fathers or just, you know, the, the structure of power that has always existed, were basically able to lay the rules down without having to defer to historical or cultural norms, because those historical or cultural norms were cut off. As opposed to Europe, where, you know, like that, that property that I'm looking at, you know, somebody owns that, right? But pretty much anywhere in Europe, and definitely it's legally protected in some countries much more than others, if you were to decide to walk across that field, it would not result in either someone calling the police, or as unfortunately it's legal in several U.S. states, their legal right to shoot you on site. Right. Like, I'll never forget, you know, you and me in, in France, you know, buying a kebab and then sitting on a stoop and eating it 
And then, you know, the person <laughs> who lives there comes in to open their door and we're on the stoop and like Americans were like, oh shit, you know? <laughs> and the person just very politely asks us to move over and goes inside their house. Because not to leave. No, not, not to, to move. Leave. But no, just like, hey, can I get into my house? Can I get into my house? <laughs> Because, you know, Europe, you know, capitalism in Europe developed out of, of, of a, a communal understanding that was, you know, ubiquitous and widespread around the idea of the commons, around the idea of like, you know, yes, my house itself, you can't come in. But my, anything outside my front door is fair game, despite what a tax map might say. Um, right. You know, you see this, you know, like in the, the I think it's called the Allmansratten in Sweden, you know, the, the idea that, you know, even a, you have a right to walk on private property, you have a right to walk through farmland in Germany, the same thing. And you have to you have to stay like 100 meters away from the house or something. But the, the right you have to, to even camp on what's theoretically yeah. someone's private property. And also just the yeah, right the Scandinavian laws are like that. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and even just and, and there's something it's a little different. But I know like when it comes to public property in England, even, you know, the right to camp, um, which, you know, in the United States, forget it. It doesn't matter. You know, part of the battle I had in, in Eugene, Oregon for a decade was was trying to, to argue for the rights of people without homes to be able to sleep in a tent in public property without being hauled off to jail in the middle of the night. Which, you know, it, it, when, I, when, when people here try to ask me what I used to do, I can't even explain it to them. Like, it's not a language <laughs> problem. I speak fluent French. It is literally like they can't conceive that this would be a political controversy. And the, the idea that someone smoking a cigarette leaning against a wall would be subject to arrest. They can't even conceive yeah. of it. Because in Europe, there were, a compromise had to be made because they were not able to cut people off from their history the way that you know the 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 devil's bargain that was the american dream was basically like you give up the culture and tradition and and, and memories of mm -hmm. the homeland mm -hmm. in exchange for this right to be american and in that so so much was sacrificed yeah so so let's um let's go to the next principle because the next principle kind of you know, informs the way that, that private property develops. So uh, currently right now I'm doing a book club on uh, Sylvia Federici's Caliban and the Witch, mm. and which means I'm rereading it. And it's, it's the, I think it's the fifth time that I've reread it. And I, like, it's just this massive horror story. Just every page. I mean, not that her, her writing is bad. Her writing is beautiful, but it's just like, you're just reading all of these really awful things that happen. And, the the commons the 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 way that the commons developed it, it's not like it was some sort of the commons themselves they were a um a, a compromise that had been reached you know a thousand years before the enclosures even longer you know this idea that okay well you know we we at least get to use this land and this is kind of kind of everybody's and then people started treating it it's like well actually it belongs to the people uh, regardless of what the lords and uh, the kings or, or the church said. Um, but, but the process of losing that, or actually, actually, because I guess probably not all of our listeners and watchers actually even understand the commons. Can you explain the commons? Um, well, kind of what you said, you know, it was, it was a compromise. It was a compromise that came out of the early Middle Ages. Um, in many ways with the, with the, with the um, rise of either, you know, the formalized feudal system or it kind of existed in much other parts of Europe, which was kind of an informal feudal system, that, that, but, but that operated on the same principle with, with less rules where, you know, you had someone who claimed the right to this land and you had, you know, people who were allowed to live there in exchange for doing A, B, C, and D. You know, but but beyond their um, obligations as part of that, whether formal or informal contract, there was this understanding that you know, to an extent, the land itself, but even more so, the land beyond what what was was considered to be those those boundaries was was for everyone. Um, you know, right around the, it was right around the same time as the Magna Carta, which is you know the document we focus on more. Um, but there there was a um, 
like a, a sister document that w was called the Charter of the Forest um, that also came out of, of, of you know, early Middle Ages England, um, signed by, I don't know, don't remember if it's the same king or a similar king, but, you know, someone with the authority to make that declaration um, that very much stated just this, that, you know, the, the right to, to chop down wood, the right to hunt, the right to use the land beyond the specific land that was being worked, you know, your farm, you know, the, the, the whatever the, the, yeah, the, the property that was the subject of the relationship between the Lord and the peasants. Um, sure. you, know, you, had, you had the right to that land to, 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 in, in order to, to um, English... To contribute to your sustenance. Um, <laughs> By the way, everybody, uh, Ali lives in France, and what happens when you are speaking primarily another language is, no matter how much of an expert writer you are, as you as you were in English, eventually we start losing our words. We do start losing our uh, words. And, then, and what's and interesting is, a, it doesn't happen so much when you're writing because there's different parts of your brain that are being. Yeah. It happens much more for me when I'm speaking. Often when I'm completely mm -hmm. stuck, if I type out what I'm trying to say, that <laughs> is fascinating. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. fascinating. But yes, there's certain <laughs> like words and concepts that, yeah, I apologize to the audience. I might struggle around because it's just, <laughs> it's not coming because I use French in most of my day to day. And your brain, right. yeah, your brain is kind of like a computer. It can only, you know, like the hard drive starts to get slow and yeah, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. that's kind of so, what happens. So. Yeah. So on, on, on the comments on these, these, these compromises. So, you know, um, like Federici like points out that actually it, you know, in some places it had started under Rome towards the collapse of Rome when, um, when slave owners started realizing, okay, well, you know, we, we need to give the slaves pieces of land for their own use. Otherwise they're going to rise up and kill right. us. And, and, and so this happened in, in many places like the, the, the Frankish and the, the German mm -hmm. um, kings, like they had done that. And then there's, um, go ahead. Well, say, you know, the pro I mean, it definitely started in Roman times. The problem is, you know, in terms of tracing the history, there's a gap, you know, and that gap is, is the gap mm -hmm. that is the Dark Ages, which, you know, for the record, yeah. and I just, I always need to clear this up because I know how misunderstood it is. We don't call it the Dark Ages because it was oh so horrible and miserable necessarily. That's kind of the myth of progress at work. At work, we call it the Dark Ages because we don't really have any documentation of it. It's dark in terms of our understanding. You know, from the collapse of Rome to the rise of of, of Christian monastery cultures, because it was the monks that were kind of the first scribes. So you had this like four or five hundred year gap. Of, of what happened. Yeah. We don't really know what happened. You know, we, we, we have very limited um, um, documents. We can tell you everything that happened in the Arabic world at that time because they were actually and, you know, keeping and much we, better records. Yeah, and, yeah, and we have a whole lot of what happened specifically around, for example, the development and spread of, the, of Christianity. You know, we, 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 we have the documents, you know, we have the founding histories of saints all over Europe from that time period. But, you know, but that's what the church was focused on. And during that period, very frankly, mm -hmm. pretty much the, the very few literate people out there were of the church. So we don't have a whole lot of documentation as to, you know, this compromise or lack thereof between the fall of the Roman Empire and, you know, around, I would say, the, the first millennium. Um, yeah. And then so, so from the, so, so the develop of, uh, develop, we're not 100% certain of like how the commons developed, but we, we know what it meant to right. people. And we have, and then we know specifically what it meant to people when the enclosures yeah. started, when suddenly the commons we know started we have going away. So can you talk about, right. like, you know, we have, again, we have the charter of the forest. Yeah. We have plenty of document, documentation coming from, you know, right before the first millennium up and until the the birth of the industrial revolution that that shows this gradual taking of land which you know you can find mm -hmm. small bits of it happening throughout europe starting in, in the 1100s and 1200s but it was it was sporadic it wasn't uh, systemic um the first systemic taking of land, at least that I've really found. And I, you know, I always say in my course, and I always say, you know, if someone can give me a previous one, let me know. 
Um, as far as I know, this is the first. And I find it very, maybe not so much ironic, but instructive in terms of what we were talking about before being that, that feedback loop. Um, the first, like, huge systemic widespread taking of land. Um, can you hear me, by the way, still? I don't hear you. Read. Oh, there we go. Okay. Something happened. Um, so the, the, yes, are we good? Okay. So the huge, um, the first widespread systemic taking of land we see actually happens right after the, the Reconquista happens, um, right in the, the same era uh, as Columbus's voyage to America and which is directly related and it is frankly the reason why Columbus was able to take that voyage because through out the Reconquista, and, and so for, for people who aren't um, aware of what I'm speaking of, you know, Spain was held for six, seven centuries um, by a series of, of Muslim caliphs. Um, it, was a, it was a series of, of Muslim kingdoms that was, you know, taken seven, eight hundreds, um, and then it was reconquered. That's the word, you know, Reconquista, you know, the, the various Catholic kingdoms of Spain over the course of several hundred years were able to retake that land up to the point where, you know, some uh, right in like the, I, I don't, I don't remember if it was exactly the year 1492, but right around that time was when they finally reconquered all of, of Spain. And one of the ways they were able to do that, and, and the primary way they were able to finance that was through taking land from the peasants in order to breed Merino sheep because merino wool at that time was pretty much the most valuable thing that could possibly come from a farm, um, that could possibly be, be raised agriculturally to the point where at, at, at certain periods in Spanish history to import a merino sheep outside of Spain carried the death penalty. They were so protective of because the money that came in from it was absolutely obscene. It is what financed the Reconquista. It is what uh, uh, allowed Ferdinand and Isabel, Aragon and Castile, to be able to take the rest of the land and declare the Spanish crown as the Spanish crown. But, you know, Columbus comes in because Columbus had started begging the Spanish crown for money to, to go on this voyage throughout the final years of the Reconquista. And they said no for various reasons. Um, but one of the reasons they said no is because all the money that was tied up <laughs> in the, the money that they were making from shifting peasants off the land in order to reappropriate that land for, for raising Merino sheep, which, by the way, also had a second effect and that, you know, when, when peasants no longer have a land, they, they don't have much choice other than to become a mercenary for the war that is being fought. So you, you, you and, yeah. and again, and that's yeah. a cycle that, that, that continues to this day, right? So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, Columbus's third or fourth ask, all of a sudden the war is over, Spain is theirs, and Ferdinand and Isabella have the money <laughs> because they still got sheep all over the place. They're still making a fortune off of, of merino wool, but they're not having to spend that fortune pushing back the Muslim empires. And so it was the money from Merino. So it was kicking peasants off the land, using the land to raise Merino sheep that financed Columbus's ability to discover the new world and what immediately happened after that, taking the land from various indigenous populations, kicking them off, pretty much forcing them, although, you know, this time it wasn't being mercenary, it was, it was simply being slaves to... Mm -hmm. work that land work in the mines exactly the, the sugar working the whatever so again you see a, this this idea that was pioneered in europe that was transferred over to the united states which without that uh you know colonization of the americas would not have been possible so if not for the merino money columbus would have never went and if not for exporting that idea to the americas you would not have the americas as we know it but then, and and i like that you I like that you do that because very oftentimes the the focus is on the enclosures in England, but you know we all know that the the, the Spanish were really the first ones to have you know the Spanish and the Portuguese were were the ones to to really kind of start off this process, and the British were a little yeah. late. To the first it. enclosures um, in in England happened in the early 1500s, and I, I'm sure again direct you mm -hmm. know inspiration. They looked over at Spain. 
you know, Spain and Portugal being like the OGs, right, when it comes to like empire and conquest. You know, we talk about the British Empire being, you know, the most widespread and sustained empire that ever existed. And yes, that's absolutely true. But they were they were super late in the game. Um, they spent they spent a sure, couple hundred yeah, years yeah. watching how everyone else did it, and then we're like, okay, we're ready. We're gonna launch this shit now. Um, yeah. And so yeah, you had so so the the this process of the um so so you explain how first of all you know the the the, the commons being lost which is land you know uh, land loss like that's that's what that is was directly related to the land loss or the eventual land loss through colonial expansion elsewhere which then of course creates more cycles where you know it, it keeps going uh you know constantly and and one of the the things um, I, you you cover it a little bit in the course, but there's there's a lot of social processes um, occurred because of um, because of these enclosures, because of the the loss of the commons. Like the uh, you know, for example, you mentioned the, the 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 farmers, the peasants get kicked off their lands um, so that sheep can be raised in Spain, and then those people become mercenaries. Or or they die or or what have you. Um, in England, we saw you know something very similar with that as well. Um, I, just just going like bringing up the, the 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 Silvia Federici connection. Of course, there's also the you know this entire process saw a complete change in the way that women were mm-hmm. treated um, and what they had access to. Um, you know, uh, uh, lots of writers has brought this up besides uh, Federici, like Vandana Shiva. That, like, you know, very often the connection that a woman has to land is is her independence. Right. Like, if you if you have access to land, if you can grow your own food, then you can actually make a decision whether or not you want to be with a man or not. You know, if if you don't like this man, then you can get rid of him. Um, if you don't have access to that connection, if, if you do not have land connection or access to the commons, your choices start to become more and more yeah. limited, um, which limits the, the way that you're able to, to wield social and political power in the world. Um, the same process, you know, it, 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 primar- or it really harms women, but it's, it's harmed everybody as well. That we, when we don't have access to land when we don't have the means of, of, of reproduction or, or of production, um, we're always at a disadvantage when we're arguing with power. Like right now in France, there, there are these strikes, you know, uh, against the, the raising of the retirement age. Um, if, if everybody has some little bit, and in the French system, at least you get, uh, you know, some bit of payout back from the government. Uh, so if you do not work, you can still kind of afford to eat for a little bit. Uh, the same thing doesn't happen in America because in America we, we don't ha- we don't have that option. Well, and also you know for, not in America. What am for I those doing? who do work, your ability to retire or not retire is not market based. It's, it's not reliant on the stock market, right? Right, <laughs> right, right, right. And and, and so I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is is there are really complex. Um, uh, consequences of this loss of land and this loss of connection to land that, that you know, you could explain sure. for months and still not even get to the end of it. But um, like what, when, when you're talking about, so your, your course is, is called land loss mm-hmm. and reconnection. And I guess that's what I'm trying to get to. Like this, this understanding what we've lost is kind of the primary part. The first half of your course, that's what that is. Um, but then the, the second half of the course is like, hey, it's also possible to to, to get this mm-hmm. back to reconnect to it. Not just possible, um, but yeah, I would so, say, I would say necessary, um, especially given you know, especially in North America, especially given what how do we even say you know the the social so much of the social dysfunction that right now you know. From my perspective, you know, your mileage may vary is leading to the collapse of American society as we know it um, is directly, you know, is, is, is many, many generations removed, of course, but but connected to both 
the epigenetic trauma of a settler population that was forced to relocate due to mass loss of land, but also not despite, you know, a certain class of people owning land, there's still no real connection to land. And because of that, you have no, you know, having no land-based culture has allowed alternatives to land-based culture, um, you know, the main culprit that I, I see doing the destructive damage would be, would be Protestant conservative Christianity, um, filling a hole. And again, in the process, you know, replacing ancestral knowledge um, and connection to land with an incredibly deadly toxic ideology that people are so susceptible to because they don't have any authentic connection, because they don't have any authentic culture, um, you know. Yeah. So, what is what is what does land culture look like? Like, what what you know? Because I, I guess we could kind of be uh, sound a little bit esoteric, but what does a culture of land connection look like? Like, you know, where do you look for this? Like, what do you? Well, you know, you know, what does it consist for, of? I, I would, I would, you know, the, I think the best. Um, example I you know the, the two best examples I could give to Americans which I think you know they're aware of both of and you know deeply romanticize and try to appropriate to an extent is the remaining culture of, of Native American First Nations in the United States but then say for example Irish culture or Scottish culture um, you know the, the European cultures that especially in like alternative spiritual communities pagan communities tend to be the the um, frameworks that are desired, that are romanticized, that people try to be a part of, to either replicate in their life or take bits and pieces from as they will, or, you know, even worse, declare to be a part of and declare to be an authority on despite having no actual connection to it in the first place. You know, it, it, it's these examples are out there. And I think, you know, for people who aren't stuck in the toxic brainwash that is Protestant American culture, you know, seeing, and, and you know, we have a long history in the United States, you know, back toward the very, very early settlers who, you know, talk about, talk about a history that they tried to erase of the, the first settlers in huge numbers, ditching, you know, places like Jamestown to go off and live with the natives because they realized, hey, what we're doing is pretty fucking horrible. And those people are, those people are happy. Like I want, I want, I want to smoke yeah. what they're smoking, so to speak, you know, like, and, and, and again, the degree to which those histories, you know, we know a little more about, about them now, but they were violently suppressed um, by Puritan America because the last thing they wanted was that example to spread. You know, they were, they, their ability to propagate and do what they want to do was reliant on this idea that, that native cultures were backwards and savage and dangerous and all these things. But unfortunately, you know, for them, there were so many colonists that got a tiny little peek and said, you know, this is really better than that whole, like, if we dance, we're going to hell thing. You know, like. I, I was reading I, for, for research on an essay a couple of months ago um, on, on the, the kind of occult origins of the, the nation state. I, I was reading Cotton Mather. Mm, oh. Like, I, I had oh, never read God. Cotton Mather before. I mean, you know, in high school, you get, you get a little they bit bring of, him like, up. Uh, you know, but I was reading but... Cotton Mather. And, and, his, and, and his description of, like, what was just outside of their shitty little muddy Puritan village is, you know, I was like, did he really just not go outside of it? And then it occurred to me, oh, no, no, of course he knew what was outside, but he was yeah. writing propaganda to make sure everybody living, starving in these rotting little wooden shacks didn't go out and actually enjoy themselves <laughs> with the people there that they were supposed and to consider, you know, And the isn't that the propaganda children. that's still being wielded to this day? Isn't, I mean, that's the propaganda that, that is yeah. wielded against you know, again, look at look at you know the culture wars. You know, go you know, <laughs> it was it was a certain kind of music in the 1980s. It was television shows in the 1990s. You know, nowadays apparently you know right. drag queens are just the the thing that are going to corrupt us for the future. You know, it, it has always been that. It has always been having to convince their rank and file that anything outside their little world is 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 is, is you know going to send them to hell. Right? It is just a 
here. But I think too on a on a on a like more political or on a more economic level as well. There's there's always this thing like, you know, I, I, in America there were always the people who were talking about you know, hey, yeah, I want to go back to the land. Like I want to, you know, I want to have a farm. I want to I want to do subsistence. You know, and and there's always this reaction like, oh, no, you don't want to be like that. Like what would you? No, no, that, that's awful. And never mind the fact that this is the way that humanity right. has lived for. <laughs> the vast majority of our history and the way that people are living right now and would like to live assuming or you know if they were allowed to live this way without the global development organizations without the the international corporations coming and saying no you need to leave or we're going to turn you into factory workers or how about you work in a call center instead of just mm -hmm. enjoying yourself and making yep. your own food. And again, you know, I, I think that the effectiveness of that is the strongest in the United States because there is very little historical examples, it, 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 you know, at least when it comes from people with the same skin tone as you or I, right, um, of, of how to live that way. So, you know, you're still, so, so it is able to be framed, again, as either this utopian fantasy or or something that is inherently unchristian and savage and and ungodly and you know will lead you down the path to the devil's doorbell or whatever. Um, whereas right. again, you know, so, so many so, of these ideas I just feel are are you know I I, I always you know, the side tangent of me of, uh, that I always reflect upon of of things that are not controversial in Europe, right? <laughs> <laughs> We have very yeah, long living off the yes. land is one of them. <laughs> right, right. Uh, um, so w one thing, uh, and I, I try to bring this up specifically in my writing because it's so profound for me. And I know this has been a, like an extremely profound thing for you too. Like when we were in America, the you know there was always a sense of like. Everybody wanted community. We always saw it like, okay, like activists and leftists, like, yeah, we need to like build community. Like we need to, you know, imagine what this might be like, because of course there's nothing like this at all anywhere else in the world. And then you go to Europe and, and, and it's like, well, wait, what? I mean, you know, like in, in the background, you can see pretty much almost all of the village that I'm living in. It's very tiny. And I know almost everybody, and it's not what I imagined. I, I, you know, I always imagined like, oh, village life is dead. Um, there are no villages anymore. Like, there is actually still village life here. You know, it, it's still, it's still subject to capitalism. It's still subject to private property. Just past our garden, that's that's all private property. Although the government at least made it so that um, it cannot be developed. You know, like the most you can ever do is have cows on there, but those trees aren't going to go away. No one's going to be able to build any homes on it. Um, but, you know, I, I remember like when we when we first arrived in France, just to see this, you know, again, the doorstep mm -hmm. thing that, that you talked about at the beginning, like we're we're sitting on a stoop eating and then we're both completely ashamed and scared that this person's going to be so angry at us that we were there. And it's like, yeah, can, can I get back? Like what? What? What have you seen specifically? Well, you know, in we'll go back like, a little bit. You know, as one thing as, I just want to underline you... because I, this is a, the bigger piece of both. You know, what I talk about, of course, but also just my my focus. You know, as a cultural observer, right? Um, it's again this I this this problem where we've been cut off from history, and so and and that gets combined with a very toxic American centric viewpoint, where it's really hard for Americans as a whole, not all Americans. But it, it, as a whole, as a culture, as a tendency, it's really hard for people to understand slash accept slash conceive that, you know, in other parts of the world, even other Western developed nations, there are these ways of being that just because you don't have them in the United States doesn't mean they don't exist. And, and again, that the whole ideology of being the greatest country in the world, and the idea that there can't possibly be an idea that's working elsewhere that we don't know about is what leads people to either focus on, you know, very obviously utopic visions or very obviously romanticized ideas. And, and it also leads to, you know, the, the idea that we don't have any blueprints to work off of 
as 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 settlers of European descent, it's actually one of the primary things that ends up justifying cultural appropriation. Um, you know, I hear it all the time, especially, you know, when it comes to like some fucking, you know, white lady, life coach, spiritual guru type who gets called out on something appropriative. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, well, it's like, well, my ancestral culture was destroyed and erased by Christianity. So, you know, what do you expect of me? I don't have anything else to go on. And I don't want to continue this toxic death trap that is Christian. You know, she's right that Christianity is a toxic death trap, sure. But the idea that her ancestral culture was destroyed and there's nothing left to look at is complete and utter bullshit. And, you know, and some people know it's bullshit. Mm. And some people... But it's... To be fair, though, you can't see this without... You can't. Being no, you Europe. can't. I agree I with that, I, but it's I, also I, not... In I had no idea how rich this stuff was. Even, you know, the way that things persisted through Christianity, like... There's even some, some ways that the church, the Catholic church specifically, you know, maintain some of the traditions, even though originally oh, they had tried to I mean, that's fight the, the Breton, at the beginning. Breton diocese, you know, where um, I live. I mean, that, that is, it's fundamental here. There are, there are rituals and traditions mm -hmm. and so many, so many like little remnants of what are, you know, both very obvious, but also confirmed by anthropologists to be remnants of pre-Christian worship here that absolutely have persisted to the common day. And they persisted because the church realized it was, it was more to their advantage to just absorb the practice than to try to oppress the practice. And you're absolutely right that the average American does not understand this. But I would also, you know, especially when it comes to people who wield authority as leaders, as spiritual teachers, who take that position mm -hmm. in the community, to me, you don't have an excuse. Because, see, if you're making yeah. six figures a year, like spreading your white lady bullshit, you have enough money to go spend a couple <laughs> weeks in the place where your ancestors came from, okay? <laughs> like you and I were living under the poverty line and somehow managed to spend a month in Europe. So don't, like you don't have an excuse. The average person I sympathize with, but when I see these, these, especially these women or men in positions of power who are the, you know, your pagan whatever, you're, you know, they have, again, they're like coaching, guru -y, whatever it is, and they are taking that position and they are spreading that whole, I don't have any ancestral culture, because, because they have a group of followers I've... who are, are breathing into their every word. Right. And then, but then, go ahead. I've wanted to... I... I wanted to 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 to, to host a um, like a, a a tour, like one of those travel tour things for like those sorts of spiritual gurus. Like, and I have a list of them that I will not name um, because I'm still kind of I just I no, just don't want I... them to exist any longer. But it's like, oh yeah, cool, okay, you 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 know, especially the ones who who say, oh, let's go to let's go to Wales and, and, and Scotland and I'll show you what everything is about here. And it's like, okay, that's your first time that you've ever been there. And you, no, no, no. Here, let, let me take you to some places, but they're not going to be super pretty and you're not going to have really nice accommodations, but this is going to be the real thing that's here and you're going to actually see a lot more. Um, and then you're going to pay me lots of money for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, so we're getting towards the end. Um, like one of the things, so, you know, and this was kind of segueing to it, the, the spiritual reconnection. Like we've talked about like a lot of the culture stuff and, you know, something else we can kind of mention too is, is and you've brought it up a, a little bit already, like the, the, the loss of the commons also really punished people um, because the, the land and the commons particularly were the meeting place. This was where people had their social right. interactions. This is where, you know, the dances, the parties, the festivals, the marriages, the funerals, all of these, these were on these common lands. This was, this was their meeting place. And we see, we see enclosure of the commons continue even in the internet age. age. And in fact, if anything, the internet is just one enclosure machine. Um, but and and so there's there are lots of other cultural aspects to land connection that we can get into you know we can fight those or begin to reconnect um, and then but but on the spiritual level as well like uh, you know because you mentioned uh, you know you and I are both animists and like we've been animists forever uh, can you can you talk a little bit about like the relationship 
to lands with an animism or an animism as you see it and through that frame? Be a little, you went from one thing to another. Um, okay. I do um, that. I do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. Just uh, let's let's talk a bit more about the spiritual um, aspect of so the connection. It's tricky, board. right? Again, like being growing up on stolen land. <clears throat> you know, I was at least uh, there was enough of a. I don't really want to call it liberal, but you know, there was a certain awareness in my community growing up around at least the fact that, that, you know, our land had belonged to someone else before we were raised on it. And so I was at least lucky enough that I remember, you know, as part of my elementary school history classes, for example, you know, we learned whose land we were on. We learned their history. We learned their history of their interactions with the colonists and how and why they lost that land. Um, you know, it didn't necessarily go beyond that. But, you know, for me as, again, as a lifelong animist, I always had this deep awareness that the land I was on is not the land of my people and that the people whose land this was slash is had an inherently animistic relationship to that land that no matter how hard I tried, I would never be able to develop on the same level. Because, you know, if you're taking an animistic viewpoint, it goes both ways. You know, there's my relationship to the land and there, there's the land's relationship to me. And there's the fact that, you know, my ancestors either, you know, not everyone directly, but our ancestors collectively, directly and or indirectly um, contributed to the displacement and slaughter of those who had an animistic relationship to that land. And don't think the land doesn't know it. And, you know, and this is, you know, and, and, and what I'm about to say, I contest, you know, is, is amongst my most unpopular views. Um, but I, after six years in Europe, I do truly believe that so many of not just the social ills in the United States, but the physical ills of the United States has everything to do with, with the land not wanting us there as a whole. Um, you know, when I look at just like the level of chronic illness, for example, and the fact that I was someone who was chronically ill almost my entire life, um, who, you know, and exactly went away when six you went years to later, that was the I do not identify thing. as chronically yeah. ill because 95% of the stuff that 20 years of doctors <laughs> could not figure out disappeared once I left that land. And frankly, when I look at like my American friends and my French friends, I know so few people here that are chronically ill compared to the United States where it just, it seems to almost be the norm. It seems to almost be the default, you know, and then that's just one little, you know, I've digressed a bit. Um, but, you know, a bigger piece of this being, you know, as someone who always kind of understood, you know, I would try to make friends, you know, the, I mean, the way small children make friends with the land because I think, you know, small children by default are animistic until they're taught not to be. Um, you know, I, I would call it the velveteen rabbit syndrome, right? Everything is real until an adult convinces you that it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when I, when I came into adolescence and, and started to have interactions with the pagan community in, in the United States, um, one of the first very deep suspicions I had as to, you know, either the intention of these folks or the effectiveness of these folks was, was how many of them seemed so deeply convinced that they had these really great relationships with the land. And I'm sorry, most of you just don't. <laughs> you just don't because that land doesn't like you. Um, again, not all pagans, hashtag. Um, I believe that there are exceptions to this rule. I believe that there is the ability to limitedly um, forge positive relationships with specific pieces of land. But I think that has to do with the history of your family, the history of the land itself, how those histories do and don't intersect. And then just also an aspect of just how adept you are naturally at connecting to anything, because we all have strengths and weaknesses. And Sorry, but, you know, connecting to things isn't everybody's inherent natural strength. But, you know, I mean, it was, a, it was a criticism that you and I shared, you know, at the beginning, when you saw the beginning of the rise of, like, Trumpism and or fascism, I remember this, like, huge pushback reaction from, from what I would call the mainstream pagan movement in the United States, 
where it was like, you know, we're going to call on the spirits of the land to fight fascism. And I'm just sitting here like, as far as the spirits of the land are concerned, you're the fucking fascist. Do like, you remember? Do you remember when it, when they started yeah. oh invoking my God. Columbia? Oh, God, that led me to drink. Oh, exactly. Just, just, just for 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 people listening who don't know don't know what we're talking about here, uh, which you don't know, God you are bless so you for not knowing what we're talking about. Oh, when we were in the United States towards the uh, uh, yeah. yeah towards the, the end, beginning of the right rise of Trumpism, left, um, when yeah, when when Trump was elected or just before that, and 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 everything there. There was a movement of witch resistance to Trump, um, which oftentimes is laughable. For example, one of the things required using a carrot. Um, It was really kind of a big joke, but there were some things that were really kind of scary, including people attempting to to do rituals for Columbia, who is a kind of constructed goddess. Um, It basically... The goddess of American. The goddess of col- destiny. She's literally the goddess of manifest like, yeah, well, destiny. Like you have that one famous painting of Columbia, like yeah, leading exactly. in the fucking settlers. Yeah. She's leading right. the telegraphs and the trains the and everything. And people are are trying to invoke this goddess to you know in their resistance to Trump, and it's like, what are you? You? No. Oh no! That's honest, oh no! Right. That's Stop. honest but work. And we laughed right around that from, time. Okay. Like, but again, it was just like, <laughs> but that, that's ridiculous to me. It's this incredible, wide level ignorance, and even worse amongst people who consider themselves to be spirit. You know, it's one thing when that's coming from like the frickin' Liberty University crowd. You know, the fundamentalist Christians. But for this coming from people who claim to be connected to the land, to be connected to spirit, to be connected to gods, to be socially aware, to be, you know, progressive, literal, liberal, anarchist, whatever they're going to like, like call themselves. I just found that incredibly, incredibly just disturbing and ignorant and again, potentially dangerous. And to me, it was just like a huge wake up call as and, to and say, how the degree to which people just don't understand what it means to be a settler on stolen land. Right. Whereas, whereas here, you know, if you go over a couple of hills from there, there's there's a there's a shrine to Mary um, at the foot of a massive oak. So it's also a shrine to the oak, and it's tended by several very extremely old, devoutly Catholic people, um, you know, who, who who care for the land around it and care for the oak. And you look at that, and and they're not they're not trying to do a pagan witch reconnection with just, land. They're just they, they're just doing they this, would, and it's like, oh yeah, that's a lot more. I would than say the most devoutly Catholic Bretons are much more witchy than the most self declaring oh, witchy yeah. North Americans, for the most part. Again, again, there are there are definitely exceptions. <laughs> American, you know, there yeah. are people I know who do not fit this mold. Um, but the exception does not disprove the rule. Yeah. But we should probably end here before we go, Wait. like, we, <laughs> before we really say what we mean. <laughs> but, um, I just, can I, yeah. can I, there's so, one thing I uh, want to elaborate this has on been great. Um, before, yeah. because that, like, as a thought I, I developed to. Yeah. halfway, but it's like really, really crucial to kind of the middle ground I'm trying to find sure. in both this course, but also my own personal work, right? So again, you, you have this narrative, you have the, the white lady guru yeah, narrative of how, you know, it's perfectly okay for me to be appropriating Lakota culture um, because my entire culture was destroyed. And then, you, but the thing is you have a pushback to that. You have a reaction to that. And the problem with reactions is often they are just as extreme as what provoked the reaction. So especially in the past decade in the United States and especially amongst, unfortunately, folks that otherwise I would consider my fellow leftist comrades, right? You have this reaction where they have gone 180 and pretty much absolutely anything you want to do that you are not connected to in terms of your ancestry is out, is, is out of bit, is, 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 is not okay. It's problematic. It's off limits. 
it's, it's by default appropriation and you're not allowed to be touching it. And the only ethical way that you have to claim any culture is to go back to the culture of your ancestors' origins. And unfortunately, this puts the otherwise progressive left into the exact same territory as the fascist, as the far right. I mean, that is a blood and soil argument. White, white people should, yeah, exactly. white people should only do white things. This is, is not a good take. Not, this is just as take. bad. It is just as harmful <laughs> as a take as I have every right to do Lakota things because I don't have any culture. They are harmful for different reasons. But one thing that also happens, and this is something I really didn't understand until I spent a significant amount of time over here, is that it also lends itself to cultural appropriation. Because one of the, the primary things that settlers don't really understand is that DNA does not equal culture, and DNA does not give you automatic access to culture. Being Irish American does not make you Irish. Being Italian American does not make you Italian. You you. Culture is, is something that, that is organic, that you are raised in, that you understand by being a part of it, that becomes a part of you by doing. So, you know, you have, you know, people who are so like they don't, they absolutely don't want to appropriate Native American culture. So they dive into Irish culture. And unfortunately, they in that they end up appropriating and doing harm to authentic Irish culture that and and. And there's this other narrative that, that is often, you know, very prominent in, in American leftist pagan discourse, which is also very harmful, which is this idea that, that quote unquote white people can't appropriate from quote unquote white culture. And that is absolutely false. That completely ignores the, the dynamic, the power dynamics that have existed in Europe for over a thousand years. And the fact that there are minority endangered cultures throughout Europe who have had to fight just as hard as Native Americans have to continue existing. And you cannot just claim to be a part of them because your great, 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 great grandmother fled the fucking famine. And you don't have a right to, to consider yourself an authority on that culture and to speak over people who are part of that culture. And I see this all the time amongst people who consider themselves to be progressive. Right. And we're we're talking about America here specifically because, I, you know, the the other way of doing this, the the thing that actually makes sense, because you you cannot be part of right. a culture unless you're part of a culture. Like, you know, you cannot understand the culture unless you're yeah. within it, and that culture will change you. And you know, you 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 can't you can't be very far away from from the people who are actually that culture. Right. And say, oh, but I'm, I'm like, going to speak about them, even though you've not. Yes, but it's also like, not and, impossible and to 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 learn about, you know, and and that's the middle road that I talk about in the course. You know, you you cannot claim uh, yeah. to be Irish if you were born in the United yeah, States and yeah. your parents were born in the United States and you have never lived in Ireland. But it doesn't mean that un learning and understanding about and participating in Irish culture is completely off limits to you even if you can't ever go to Ireland. But there's a way you have to approach it. There's a certain amount of humility that needs to be taken on. There's a certain amount of respect that needs to be taken on. You know, very similar to, to white people that are accepted to, you know, who are taught Native American culture by Native teachers, right? You learn by sitting and shutting the fuck up and understanding that this is not your culture and therefore you are going to defer to who is teaching you. And so, you know, that's one of the things that I try to highlight is that there actually is a way to reconnect to to what your ancestors were were, were severed from, to what, what they lost. But there's a very kind of specific way you have to do it. And unfortunately, so many Americans who try to go down that road do it in a very bad way that just gives a bad name to Americans in general. And frankly, we already have a really bad name, just so you all know. Like, we don't... We don't need to add to this. Like, I can promise you as an American living abroad who constantly has to prove that I'm not one of those Americans, anything we can do to not make being an American worse, I'm going to thank you for. And again, I'm, I'm happy to teach you how to not be an asshole American. Like, if, 
if I have a life work <laughs> nowadays, especially, you know, if, if I can combine it with teaching about land, I would love to teach you not to be a dick. Um, because this just, there's just too much of it and it's painful. <laughs> and again, like I, I constantly are held account for the yeah. dickishness of, yeah. of others. And yeah, if we can like turn down the dick, that would be great. So that's what I, what I wanted to turn a dick. <laughs> turn <laughs> down. Can we just the turn dick. down the dick? I love it. That's I a great way to end to this. On the dick. So, um... Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. So this is uh, this this was Ali Valkyrie. Um, her course, Land Loss and Reconnection, starts 25th, on twenty three March, I believe. Yeah. Uh, but you can sign up twenty fifth. Sounds good. After, yeah. And right? Um, like there will be a. Yeah, yeah, and um, I'll I'll give a link for everybody at the end of this, uh, and also on. Everywhere that this will show up uh, for that as well. Um, and also the course is sliding scale. So, um, and yeah, so this has been the realign. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Ali. It's great to be on a podcast. We used to do Empire Scrubble together. Um, that was a lot it, of fun. You know, we, Maybe we, sometimes there's, we there's no Probably thing we signed that said we wouldn't. So, you know. That's true. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody, and I will talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening to The Realign. In this episode, I spoke with artist, writer, and animist Ali Valkari. To find out more about her course, Land, Loss, and Reconnection, which starts again 25 March, go to abeautifulresistance.org and search under the Courses tab. I'm Reed Wilderman. You can find other episodes of The Realign and also my writing at read.substack.com. That's R-H-Y-D.substack.com.